Thanks, Todd. So first we wanted to thank all the students and faculty for coming to our event this evening. We got a lot of people and it's amazing that we were able to partner with a lot of different groups. Um, my name is Lauren Duffy. I'm a senior here. I'm a major in supply chain information management and finance, and I am also the president of the supply chain club. Today, we're really excited to hear from Dr. Ray Andre, an organizational um, physiologist, best-selling author, and a professor at Northeastern University. She's also been the recipient of numerous awards for her innovative ideas and journal publications. In the past, she has held positions at IBM, General Motors, and MCA Incorporated. Right now, she focuses on working with climate leaders to increase education on sustainability. She believes that human progress must be measured not only on economic performance, but also on the quality of life. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Andre. Thank you so, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, I'm an organizational psychologist, a very important word <laughs> that didn't Sorry. come up. <laughs> uh, very important because that's my perspective on so much of what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So let me work on sharing my screen here. Um, hmm. Which I'm gonna have a problem here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to go out for a second, guys. Let me just see what happens. Something First happened. time was the charm. We added up. Um, those of you who are just joining, uh, we're asking you to please mute yourself, um, but feel free to keep your cameras on. Um, as Dr. Andre gets her presentation shared with us. You're not seeing it yet. That's. There we go. Now you're seeing it? Okay, great. Okay, so. Okay, so we're all set. Todd, everything's good? Great, are you on mute, Todd? Yes, uh, I was on mute, but we're good to go. And, and we can see your slide. Great, all right. Welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here to talk about climate change. It's the most important major macro uh, wicked problem that we face today. Uh, not the only one, but very, very important one. So let's let's see what we can learn, learn together about it. So my main message to you is that we need to act fast to minimize global warming. You probably already know that. Um, my work starts where the science leaves off. You already know about the, the changes in the climate. But we need to act to fix this problem. And so I've created the five practices model that tells leaders what they need to do to solve the problem. I put it this way, I maybe tell is a little strong, but it guides leaders to know what they need to know to solve the problem. I developed the five practices model over a period of 10 years. It sounds a little academic, but what it really does is it summarizes what my students needed to know as I started 10 years ago, asking them, working with them around climate change in business and how it affects business and how business affects it, I, I started to listen to them and what they needed to know. And I started to put it into files and gradually this file built up to uh, a lot of information that I distilled into the five practices. So that's what we're gonna cover in general tonight. Um, the other part of my message is that business is the key stakeholder that turns natural resources into products. So if you are in business, you're going to be at the forefront of, of change and uh, hopefully solving the, the climate problem. We need to think about what our strengths and weaknesses are as decision makers as we go forward. And by this, I mean uh, those of us who think of ourselves as members of team humanity. We're all members really of team humanity. And what are our strengths and weaknesses as a team going forward? Social science uh, that I studied during this period work and working with my students suggests that there are important limitations on our ability to cooperate. And so, and those are listed there, you guys can read them. 
Uh, therefore, I, I believe these days we need to place more bets on our talents as competitors. We need to do more to support innovation financially from governments. We need to understand more about how innovation works. Uh, and in general, grow public and private support for innovation. But we're going to get to that much, much later in the, um, in the presentation. So our agenda for tonight is, first of all, to discuss the five practices model, go over it, um, have a little fun with it. We're going to have some discussion. We're going to have some little short quizzes. Uh, so uh, I really believe that even though this is a terribly serious problem, we need to find a comfort a place of comfort where we can discuss it so that we don't get um, depressed by it. And, and uh, we need to be, to find a positive place to address it uh, as, a, as team humanity. We're gonna take a look at how social scientists size up human decision-making and team humanity, and then we're gonna talk about innovation. So what I'm not going to cover is the science. You're going to find that in other places. My course and my, my book and my work is fairly unique in that it brings a set of information to business school students about how they can act to address the problem. Um, so it builds on the science and the science is you know, more and more clear that, for example, here is um, Hurricane Florence that dumped huge amounts of water on the southeastern part of the United States, record-breaking amounts. Uh, major hurricane, certainly related in terms of how much uh, uh, precipitation it brought to the southeast related to climate change. Um, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble with this button here. Uh, here is the smoke plume from the fires in California last year, a 1200 mile smoke pl plume, very annoying. Ray, you just muted yourself. Just gotcha. the, Maria, okay. can you're back, you're back live with your right. volume. And uh, thank you. And also um, the, the, the polar vortex will get you if you don't watch out. If you live in Texas, it's gonna get you. If you uh, even, even now it goes all the way to Texas. So that's an issue. Um, most recently, just yesterday, I saw this poignant bit of information. The little pink dots are the annual peak of the cherry blossoms in Kyoto, Japan. And as of uh, March 26th is, was this year's peak, and it is the earliest peak in 1,200 years. So now we get all this sad, depressing information. Uh, the question is what to do about it. So. I would like to do a little dialogue with you. See this word dialogue has a capital on it. A dialogue is a special kind of communication where each of us speak from our heart about what we believe about a certain issue that I'm gonna give to you. Uh, doing dialogue helps us to clarify who we are, what we believe. Um, you, you know the old, the old saying that you don't know what you think until you say it. Uh, in some ways dialogue helps us to do that. So when we tell our story to others, we help to clarif clarify our identif identity for ourselves, And to some extent, this fosters leadership. It helps you to find your voice uh, and convince others with that voice. So there, um, these, uh, Todd has identified some students that are gonna participate in our first of two dialogues this evening. The first is, uh, so the guidelines are first of all, to speak authentically as I've just descri described. Do not cross talk. So, so if Dale speaks up and says, I say, blah, 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 Jane comes along, she does not address Dale. She doesn't, Dale might have triggered something in her thoughts, but she doesn't address him. She speaks from her, from herself. Um, and in, I use this a lot in class. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work here. It's a little experimental. I've done it a couple times, um, but it really Gets, gets us to a variety of ideas and to very personal ideas. The point is to listen carefully to others and, and try to understand their reality and not assume that in a group, everyone has the same reality. So uh, Todd, you've got your, your students there ready to address the question. Yeah, for the, those of you who uh, remembered volunteering, I think there are eight of you. Um, I, I didn't track names in order, so, so um, if somebody could just unmute yourself and 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 respond to that, please. Hi, um, I was I think I was the first person to message you. Great. But, um, uh, so what are you thinking 
and feeling about climate change. I think um, one of the big things that sticks out to me is just the spectrum of it. It's this giant, huge problem that it feels like nobody can fix. Um, it seems it's like detrimental and you almost want to just give up because there's so many people that don't believe in it or just that it's it's just so hard to make that kind of change too because it takes a lot of what seems like legislation and stuff. Um, so I would say it's just like a very large and scary thing. Thank you. Someone else. Thank you very much, Macy. Um, I can go next. Uh, I've been researching in my research paper. Um, I've found that the emission levels during COVID for supply chains has dropped drastically. Um, some of the lowest levels that we have in a while. And I think that I've just been thinking that there needs to be a conversation that maybe we can start playing to businesses in a sense of supply chain resilience means there's smaller supply chain networks and smaller supply chain networks closer to your source means less ships, less transportation. And those are the going to be the places that um, just the globalization has increased emissions immensely. So if you maybe play to businesses as like a profit saving or an agility and resilience topic instead of more of a supply chain, uh, instead of more of a climate based topic, um, just for people that might not think of it as being very important, you might still be able to sway their, like their opinions by like decreasing their transportation, which would decrease their emissions. Thank you, Lauren. Volunteer number three. Yeah, let's keep it coming, please. If you remember, if there's a I'm happy to jump in. Um, I, I feel like a, a tremendous amount of guilt because like as I become more educated about climate change, like there's still things that I know I'm doing incorrectly, but like I'm like too, uh, it feels like too much of an inconvenience to change. And then additionally, from a supply chain perspective, like I work in logistics and many of my customers ship chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, like GMO seeds, things that like I'm aware, are like possibly detrimental. Uh, and like from a capitalistic perspective, like I continue to do it. It's my job. It's what pays me. But like, should I be reprioritizing like customers that I'm willing to service? Like, is there a line that I should draw where I'm not going to work with certain people because their business ethics don't align with mine? Uh, and it's definitely like a, a point of contention that I deal with constantly kind of go back and forth on. Thank you. Um, I think that recently there has been a relatively large shift in, I'll say um, the number of individuals that are committing very strongly to environmentalism, whether that be a low or no waste lifestyle, um, or even smaller things, you know, trying to not use plastic bags or not use plastic straws, things like that. And while I do believe that individuals' actions can make a difference, I think that it's those things are just a very small drop in the bucket and that really progress uh, to combat and reverse climate change is really only going to come from a big corporation, um, not a single big corporation, several, um, and that the, I'll say the system around it needs to change and that there does need to be uh, maybe this is cynical, but I believe there does need to be an economic incentive related to um, large companies embracing sustainability. Uh, as I, I don't necessarily believe that there is another way that corporations will uh, value it nearly as much as they value um, you know, the economic factors that drive their profits. Thank you, Abigail. I think that's a good point, Abby. Um, oh, you're not allowed to cross talk, Elijah. Okay. 
Uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, uh, 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 it's, there's always the first. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. But thank I think you. I think there does need to be. Am I allowed to talk about incentive, economic incentive, or you can talk about whatever you want? Just don't talk directly to oh. Abigail. Okay, I I do think there there needs to be some economic incentive, kind of what someone was saying earlier. <laughs> um, I think that there is economic incentive in green practices themselves, like with lean and clean supply chain. I do think that companies can ultimately save money at the end of the day by adopting these clean uh, supply chain practices. Um, so as far as economic incentive goes, I think it's all about education right now and just educating people that they can save money by adopting cleaner practices. So Elijah, if I were to come back to you and say, now Elijah, if, if off the top of your head you were answering that question, would you answer that question about incentives or do you have some other idea that's on your mind? Um, Maybe you don't. I, I don't want to, you know, but yeah, I, I do think um, I, we, I need to start holding myself more accountable. I need to hold myself accountable before I can hold other people accountable. Um, I, I personally believe that corporations are responsible for a majority of the um, climate change that's going on right now. However, I can't, it's kind of um, counterproductive when I'm complaining about corporations where um, the city of Charleston doesn't even recycle. So ultimately I don't recycle. I just need to start uh, focusing on myself and what I can do before I talk about what other people can do. Wonderful. I knew that original idea was in there if I poked at you a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next. I think one of the big things that is um, about climate change that directly deals with the supply chain is um, the rise of hurricanes and storms and that directly affects like sea transportation as well as air cargoes. So that'll be like a good incentive for corporations to start thinking about being being more sustainable, um, being more sustainable too. Say that. Say it again. The the your main point. Like if uh, we don't care about climate change, we'll have more problem. Like we'll see like more problem with. Uh, rising rate of having storms, hurricanes and stuff like that. So that will kind of affect um, transportation in terms of sea traveling or air travel. Absolutely, okay, thank you. One more and then let's move on. I'll jump in. Um, so as far as climate change goes, I'm not the most educated, but I mean, at this point in time, I'll be honest, I feel pretty indifferent about it because I feel like the dialogue around climate change was for, I always associate it with like the like uh, the ice caps or the polar bears and I know it uh, it's more than that but that's what I always associate it with so and you know living in South Carolina I I felt like I didn't have a connection with it but um you know now that I think about it um uh like even in South Carolina uh, I initially think of like the paper mills and things like that so just thinking about climate change and this uh, and having that disconnect, I feel like um, that uh, people need to kind of expand their um, expand their horizon, so to say, because I feel that disconnect is really the main issue that a lot of people have with believing in climate change. Okay, okay. Well, as usual, it always amazes me. We came up with a great variety of ideas and all of them, uh, I think, important ideas that we could go into in great detail uh, if, if we wanted to. And in some ways, approaching the climate change problem and especially within your professional lives is gonna be left up to you. Nobody's gonna guide you except during your educational experience. But beyond your educational experience, you're going to have to have a strategy for understanding what's happening in the world and for dealing with it. Hopefully, you'll you'll gain that strategy as you uh, learn more about climate change in your in your departments and in your classes. So let's move on to what my research shows, my my work working with students shows, and the five practices about and, and so my book on the five practices is only 220 pages long. People praise it, uh, and I have to give some credit to my editors, 
for for its for condensing a very huge subject into just two areas, uh, into just two topics, which is climate change and energy. I don't discuss, for example, agriculture. I discuss the the, the two main strategic elements really that are most important to business and also to team humanity. So our goals as team humanity trying to solve the climate problem are to avoid the worst effects of climate change, create a clean energy future and do this all through democratic processes. I don't do a lot with democratic processes in my work because it's just beyond the 220 page limit. But uh, as you all know and have experienced in, in recent years, the democratic process is how we're going to change a lot of the regulation and, and so on that is going to guide corporations. And it's very, very important. We talk about that in practice four and practice five. Um, and, uh, you know, very important to, to keep thinking about. So the five practices consist of, first of all, what is a practice? It's learning a set of facts, theories, and strategies, and then applying these to drive policies, plans, and actions towards team humanity's climate goals. And as a social scientist, I use social science along with informed reasoning because social science doesn't tackle every problem, um, along with informed reasoning to help guide our decisions. So whatever your college major, uh, for, you know, people ask me, how, how can I become a, a good leader for the planet? So whatever your major, whether it's a supply chain or whatever, uh, the first thing my advice is to be really good at it. Be really good at your specialty. Be at the top of your field because that's where, that's where you're going to get the opportunities to lead. Be familiar with the five practices of leadership. And then after you graduate and, after, and as you, you know, continue on in your life, just keep learning, um, learning in your, in your various roles as a human being. Supply chain specialists in particular need to think about, I think, these things. Um, first of all, the, what we often refer to as the industrial age is really the age of oil. So you really need to know the basics of the history of oil and how much is left and where is it and what will it cost because obviously it's crucial to everything you do um, and also be very much aware from where we are in the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy how long is that going to take how is it going to affect your company and so on strategic sourcing is going to be crucial what are the current and potential impacts of climate and energy issues on the supply base and supply networks and where are the next great supply chain innovations going to come from? The logic of the five practices model is as follows. First of all, we all need to get the truth. Second, we need to assess the risks to our company, to the planet, uh, based on what we know about the truth. We need to weigh the stakes of various stakeholders from companies to communities. We need to define the business of business. What is it that business can and can't do in this uh, in solving this climate crisis, and then who globally is going to get this done, and what are they what are they going to do? Who who is who is going to solve this on a planetary basis? So practice one is to understand where your own truth comes from. Now, folks, I can only give you just a few tips uh, in each of the practices. There's so much more in the book, um, and I hope you I, I know it's free to you in your library. I hope you get a chance to to take a look at it. You should understand where your own truth comes from. So when we do a when we do a um, uh, a dialogue as we just did, in some ways people are speaking their truth because what comes to the top of their head is what they're thinking and, and believing and working with. And truth is something that happens both intellectually and emotionally, and it also comes from the media and 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 how who 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 we choose to allow into our heads to influence us. So one of my goals for my students is to make sure that they become good lay readers of science. If you're not a scientist, you need to have some exposure to how science is created and to the limitations of your ability to use that science. You have both strengths and weaknesses as non-scientists. And as a, um, you need to be a good consumer of science. And as a leader, you need to um, make, be making make or buy decisions. Am I going to, you know, hire some scientist in order to tell me, for example, um, how much sea level is going to rise in, in Boston? 
or am I going to think of maybe I can do it myself? These are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about in a practice on getting the truth. So I want to, throughout the presentation, I'm going to give you a few little quizzes. Now, no fair looking this up on Google. It's not fair. Plus, you're going to get the wrong answer, I think. So what I'd like you to do is to inundate uh, uh, Todd with your answers to this question. The average global temperature on Earth has increased by somewhat more than one Celsius since 1880. How much is that in Fahrenheit? So put it in the chat. You, you, if you get embarrassed, you can send it just to Todd. If you're, you know, willing to see, have the whole world see your answer, you can, you know, uh, chat to everyone. How you doing, Todd? You getting some? Two, two have come in out of 207 participants. Here they come, now they're coming in. What are you getting? All over the place. Like what? Give me some numbers. 16, 33.8, 2.4, um, five. Um, okay, all right, three. that's enough. Eddie, <laughs> that's enough. So I asked, I when I talked to your faculty this morning, I asked this question. And they were a lot of scientists and they got it right, a lot of them. But you guys, nah, not so much. You're Americans and it's very normal for you not to understand what Celsius is. So how much is Celsius, one degree Celsius is, in Fahrenheit is 1.8 degrees. Now, uh, there's this whole thing about the formula, the nine fists, but that's about the scale. What I'm asking you is about the degree so that when you read one degree Celsius, what are you actually perceiving? If you're not perceiving 1.8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, you may have a different, a different emotional response. So for example, um, we, you know, we, we keep saying we've got to hold the earth to no more warming than two degrees Celsius. Well, that doesn't sound like too much, two degrees, but when you think of that as 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and you think, ooh, rounding up, that's four degrees. Maybe that's important. So again, I want you to be a good reader. And as a, as a supply chain man management person, you need to be able to do that, uh, that calculation. Some people just say double it. It's not quite that, but that helps. So you need to be able to read Celsius, to think Celsius, and read and think metric. And all of us should be lovering, lobbying our government to enforce the Metric Conversion Act. Back in 1975, we swore as a country that we were going to sw switch to metric, and we never did. So a word to the wise politically. OK, here's another question. Do you read energy well? Very, very important to your business. Supply chain, is, energy is everything. An energy company has just discovered a shale play that may yield 3 billion barrels of oil at current rates of world consumption. How long will this much oil last in the world? Give us your estimates. Send them to Todd. No fair looking Six at Six hours, up. two weeks, two days. Three days, one day, five days, one day, three months, one day, one day. <laughs> okay. Three days, one day, eight months. <laughs> Where are you getting those? Those one days. Those are one pretty, year, one hour. Pretty, all right. <laughs> a lot of now hours, weeks. So all over the place. Thanks, everybody. You guys are you guys are playing with us here. Okay. So the world uses about a hundred billion million barrels of oil every day. So three billion barrels last thirty days. Now, so don't let somebody trick you when they say, "Oh, we discovered three billion barrels of oil," and you think, "Oh my God, that's enough to last for a million years." Now, you know, you guys know that I was going to be tricking you, so you put in one day, two days, but it's very important to have some kind of reference figure in your mind as you think about how oil is used going forward. I, I, in, I would think in particular of one of the officials from one of the southeastern states, maybe your state, I'm, I don't remember which it was, but uh, there was a time a few years ago when uh, someone was talking about drilling for oil offshore of South Carolina, North Carolina, wherever it was. And the official in that, in that uh, state was saying, you know, I'll be damned if I'm going to sacrifice the beaches of my state for, you know, one month worth of oil, right? And that's a kind of calculation. Again, I want you to be a quick reader because you're likely to skim over this if you're reading it and just respond more emotionally to the fact. Okay, practice two, assess the risks. 
Um, I think maybe you guys can take a look at all of what's here. A key factor here for you to understand is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how it measures and reports risk. I can't go into that today, but pay attention to that and learn how that's happening because that is the global assessment of risk. Uh, and also learn how leaders and organizations make decisions on managing and assessing risk. It, we tend to be fairly conservative and um, to, see, to see risks to the planet or to the company some, as something to be managed. Whereas in fact, it's, you know, climate change is a wicked problem, a problem that can't be managed. So here's some risks to the planet. Let me uh, see if we can get some answers. The climate is changing at a pace that's far faster than anything seen in how many years? Don't bother inundating Todd, we won't, we won't discuss them. You guys just choose one. Okay, the right answer is 65 million years. Changing at a pace, that's right. So the, the, the climate is changing at a huge rate. The difference between when I was your age and your age is that at my, it, what, the climate wasn't changing rapidly at my age. You could predict that 20 years down the road, it was gonna be similar to what it was at you know, day X. Here's another one. Now this one, I'd like to hear what people answer because I'm curious. Throughout history until about 200 years ago, the Earth's atmosphere contained 270 parts per million of carbon dioxide. What do scientists believe to be the safe upper limit of CO2 in our atmosphere? Please send your answers to Todd. We have D, B, 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 C, <laughs> B, D, D, a lot of D, C. Okay. All right, okay, so you guys don't know. I'm surprised you don't know because the answer is 350 parts per million. And that's the, the name of uh, Bill McKibben's organization of young people that he's put together across the entire world. Uh, it's called 350.org to help to address the problem. So keep that number in mind, guys, 350.org the safe upper limit. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about how high we are right now. Where are temperatures increasing the most? You can tell Lauren's collecting these, Todd's collecting them. Yeah, either of us, we're hosts, so we can see. We're getting some B, C's, D's, a lot of C's, some D's. Okay, D's the correct D's, answer. D's, D's. At yeah. the polls, at the polls, good answer. Okay, so how did you do on those three questions? I mean, if you did really badly, maybe you wanna read up a little bit more, especially this particular question is pretty much common knowledge among people who are you know, aware of what's going on. Okay, now some of you in the, in the, in the uh, dialogue said, you know, this seems like a, 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 an intractable problem. And you might've said, well, and I'm inundated every day with awful things that are happening to the planet. My advice to you, if you feel that way in particular, is to watch just one, one bit of information, and that's this amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is readily available, it's published very frequently, and it tells us uh, the condition of the planet. And as you can see from 1960, all the way up until now, uh, things are going up steadily and they're, they just are increasing. So we were at 350 about here, the, the you know, the, what scientists no. imagine. I'm sorry? I said, uh, I it. Yeah. Okay. Let's, please, let's please mute our mics, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Um, so it's called the Keeling curve after the man who invented it. And if you lay the Keeling curve on the history of CO2, this is thousands of years before 1950, you can see that the world was, it, you know, it kind of goes up and down for various reasons, blah, blah, blah. But here is the healing curve laid on top of that. So we are in uncharted waters when it comes to um, uh, the future of the planet. Now, what's so urgent? So here is, this is the, the Mauna Loa Observatory. Um, and Somebody needs to mute their microphone. Yeah, if you can please, everybody double check. Your, your microphone might have gotten bumped and, and come live. Please do um, double check Thank and make sure it's Thank you. Thank That's you. much better. Uh, with 200 people on, you know, we all, we're doing a great job actually considering. So at 450 parts per million, that's when we believe that the average global temperature will likely reach two degrees Celsius, which is how much Fahrenheit? times 1.8 or 3.6 Fahrenheit. 
So we, re we just reached 421 and we anticipate that we're gonna hit 450 by 2037. So that's what's so urgent. You do the math and you watch the Keeling curve and you go, uh-oh. Um, so climate change, uh, when you think of it as supply chain risk, the, 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 I think the, the main thing that I have to say to you supply chain majors is that you are at the forefront on the front lines of, of this problem. And I, who was it? Um, you know, Jackson was saying during the, the dialogue that you know, he worries about this, that he's, you know, he's right there at the forefront, moving toxic chemicals and all kinds of things um, and, and, and doing it maybe not in a very green way. Well, that's what business does. And we all have to do our best to improve what business does. And you know, you'll find your avenues to doing that. Um, so companies face a lot of risks. One of them is regulatory risk. And um, for example, in 2021, you might, guys probably heard about this in your SCM classes that Germany passed a law requiring German companies to protect um, human rights and environmental rules throughout their global supply chains. So somebody that's, that's concerned about the ethics and the, and the impacts uh, in Germany, it was just helped a great deal by that law. Now in our country, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, to pass such a law, but um, there we are. So when you think of some of the risks, you also wanna think about the science that tells us about the risks. So what we have here is a comparison of, I'm trying, let me just. Yeah. So I'm having a little trouble with, am I still with you guys? Yes? Yes, and we're looking at a very yeah, alarming yeah. picture of a very different Ho Chi Minh city at oh, some okay. point. Oh, okay, that's what I couldn't see. I couldn't remember which city it was. So, so. So here are two pictures of Ho Chi Minh City and the blue is the land underwater at high tide, okay? Uh, projected forward to something I can't see. Projected forward to when? 2050? Yeah, only a couple, you know, 20 some years from now, 27, uh, 29 years from now. Yeah, not too far in the distant future, 2050. Okay, so, so on the left is a, a previous projection, uh, but the science of that projection wasn't very good because what they've learned in the interim is that the elevation of the land and the buildings that are on the land affect the projections. So one of the things as, a, as somebody who needs to be on top of the truth is that you need to be on top of things like this. So a lot of supply chain is moving from, um, from China, let's say, to, to, the, to the Southeast uh, Asia. And obviously Ho Chi Minh City is a, a, a key uh, port and you've got to know this stuff. This one is Shanghai in China. And up here you can see the, the route that goes right down into the Bund, into the center of Shanghai. Uh, I had the privilege of, of taking that trip one time on a ship. We got grounded, at, at, this is 20 years ago. We got grounded at the outset uh, of, the, of the river there. And you can see what's gonna happen to Shanghai. I mean, if you go up the river of Shanghai and you, 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 you can see the, the entire city is built like one foot, I, I don't know what the exact number, but one foot uh, above sea level. And it's a huge problem. And this is the kind of thing you need to be aware of uh, looking forward. So uh, practice three is, is to weigh the stakes. And this is in some ways the hardest thing for me to speak about to, with you because it's so complex. Um, it's the relationship between business and government and you need to know about that. Um, and you need to know about stakeholders and what their, their stakes are. So uh, what I'm gonna do tonight is to consider regions as stakeholders. So Europe as a stakeholder or North America as a stakeholder. There are many other ways to think of this, but just for simplistic, simplicity's sake, I'm gonna do that. So that means that if we're, if we're looking at regions, um, regional stakes, we wanna be thinking about, let's, let's consider Europe. So here's a, here's a quiz question. Paris is on the same latitude as what city on the Eastern coast of North America? Todd would be thrilled to have your input. 
And you might even add, and therefore. Uh, I got into New York, DC, New York City. Uh, more Big Plus Apples. Oh, mes amis, plus nord. Uh, DC, Boston. Plus nord. More Tom Brady's old haunting grounds. Uh, Maine, Montreal, Bar Harbor, Bangor, Maine. Okay. Boston. All right. Chicago, Portland, Maine. I'll Good, stop there. Nice. Another New York. Okay, here it is. Paris, St. John, Newfoundland. Okay, ooh, that's, that's fascinating information. So how does this part of the world stay so warm given that it's so far north? And the answer to that question is there are currents in the ocean that, for, that take water, warm water from the Gulf of Mexico, shoot it up in a current towards Europe that keeps Europe warm and then comes down back through Greenland and so on and, and comes down and then goes under. And there's the currents like this all over the world. But one of the most important ones for particular stakeholders is this one, because if that current slows down or stops, no more warm water to Europe and Europe goes into a deep freeze. This is one of the reasons why the European countries are, are very eager to work on climate change. Okay, so that current is called the AMOC, the North Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And research shows that it is now at the slowest in 1000 years. The last IPCC report, uh, the two, 2015 was saying, yeah, it's not such a big problem, but newer research is saying, well, it is slowing down and we better pay attention to it. Again, it's the kind of information that you guys should be aware of when it comes to climate change. And let me just put a plug in here for what you should be reading. To, uh, the, the, my be best source of information on climate and business is the Financial Times. I can't afford the Financial Times, but I take it anyhow. It's like $500 a year. I don't think there's even a student rate, but try to read the Financial Times if you can get a hold of it in your library or whatever it is. Um, and lest you think that the um, um, warming is only affecting the North Atlantic, here is a graphic of how it's affecting uh, the Great Lakes and imagine the stakeholders that are that are uh, uh, plying their their ships uh, on the Great Lakes and notice that the ice cover is significantly reducing in the Great Lakes. Okay, here's one that I'm going to let you do at home, which is draw a map of the Arctic Ocean and label the contiguous countries. I hope that you don't go to bed tonight before you you work that one out. Um, and one of the, I'll just, one helpful hint is that one of the, the key stakeholders there is Russia. They've already planted a flag, I think, under the North Pole, hoping that when those, those transportation routes open up, they're going to get to control them. Big stakeholder conflicts are likely to occur. Okay, uh, practice four is to define the business of business. So whenever we talk about climate change or change for climate change, we have to be talking about business. And the question here is, are businesses pursuing weak, sustainab weak sustainability or strong sustainability? Weak sustainability is defined in, the, in academic parlance as sustainability for your organization, that's fine. But what we really need to solve the planetary problem is strong sustainability. So all of you are gonna be making career decisions about which kind of company you're gonna work for. And I hope that if you're interested in working on supply chain, supply chain if it worries you, that you work hard to find companies that are on the forefront of change. That's not gonna mean that they're perfect, but um, it, it, they're gonna be tempted to, to go to look green in order to hire you because they know that your generation cares deeply about green. And what you need to do is find, is really do your due diligence and find what, which companies are seriously trying to, to, um, to affect change. Okay, so, what I'd like to do next as a preliminary to talking about what your education is doing for you in terms of climate change is do dialogue number two. So we have to find 10, you know, some more willing volunteers to answer this question. What do you think, Todd? I'm wondering if, if it might be faster just to revisit the, the same who spoke earlier, because with, with 200 people, it's probably gonna be shy with people joining in. It, it Excellent might... idea. Okay, so if you're still on, and you were in the first dialogue, we'll just re revisit you. And, and, and if you remember the order you went in, please do do that. And, and that'll um, help speed things along. 
So whoever spoke first uh, earlier in the discussion, please go get go ahead now, and we'll go from there. I went second, but okay, I can go. go for it. Um, go, yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm from Northern Virginia, so I live on the Potomac River, so I've always lived um, on a water source. But moving to Charleston, they definitely, with the beaches, they definitely use that well um, in like pertaining to climate change education. Um, so they kind of, like you said, like they're marketing it as not only is it going to hurt the environment, but it's also going to hurt the city and the market and the, and just like the economy as a whole. Um, and College of Charleston also a lot of times, I know our freshman book was about water. Um, so they definitely have done a good job in a lot of the, like opening up those conversations about climate change. I think I went next. Um, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, I think I went first, but I missed, um, I missed it there. Um, I was gonna say, um, my feeling about climate change education is I think we get a lot of information like thrown at us in this like modern world of just seeing so like information overload all the time so you're hearing all of these things and you have to check on all of these you have to fact check a lot of them and see who's telling the truth and I feel like it's very overwhelming so I um like just uh ciphering through all that information and what side to be on and like what companies should I buy from like how honest and open are they about their sustainability and that kind of thing. Thank you, Macy. I feel um, like um, living in Charleston spending so much time here that like I've been forced to watch like the tide change on a coastal floodplain and see like friends houses and things like lose parts of their lot to the rising tide. And so like the awareness is definitely more so there in Charleston. But as far as addressing it, I don't really see like a lot of action, especially from the city like recently with the new changes and representatives and stuff. We hear more about it and like the plans to try and set up a new drainage system. But I feel like it's sort of like unspoken, like everyone's aware of it, but it isn't really addressed by, uh, by, by the city or the state legislature. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, to be honest, I don't really feel like I have had any sort of formal education about climate change, like other than this presentation. I mean, I think the I'm a supply chain management major at CFC and there is, you know, we do learn about the triple bottom line and things, but I would say, at least in my experience, it's been, I'll say, highly conceptual and uh, talked about in reference to businesses, obviously. So, you know, how can a business manage these things? A business needs to manage these things. It's, I wouldn't say there's ever really a discussion of the specifics of current situations um, as there has been in this presentation. Uh, frankly, I wouldn't say there's a ton of information specifically about the climate crisis. It seems to be more like uh, what a textbook has included about how a business can conceptually do well in addressing sustainability or like the laws surrounding um, corporation sustainability, things like that. Thank you, Abigail. I would say my experience is frustrating. I, uh, I have this feeling that people um, don't like to talk about climate change because they are afraid of it. Um, I think we going forward, at least at least all of the classes I've ever taken, my educators have not really educated me about climate change, mainly probably because they're not educated on climate change. Um, so I think we just need to get rid of the stigma going forward about climate change. And I think we need to get rid of the debate um, because I do feel as if living in the United States compared to some of my friends that live in Europe, there is no debate whether climate change is real 
Um, so the fact that we even have one is, is a little frustrating. Um, I think it should just be taught completely in, in all schools um, going forward. But um, yeah, so that, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Elijah. One more, and then we're gonna move on because we're, you know, we don't have infinite amounts of time. One more for a person. So I've previously attended uh, TOTS training about um, sustainability for our freshmen. So I do believe that a college generally does a good job with um, educating students when they first come into the college with sustainability models. And also I've noticed um, not just within the business school, um, a lot of classes are very sustainability focused. Um, it's also very heavily um, discussed in the math and science department. But I do think that on a city and state level, it's not, it's kind of been pushed under the rug and like not a lot of people really do anything about it given that we are a relatively conservative, conservative state. Okay, thank you, CM. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I ask you to do this in part because I wanna make a few points about education and what, what business schools are doing. Um, so one study by Nancy Landrum and her partner, uh, and which builds on a bunch of other studies that she's done is that essentially sustainability, a strong sustainability is not being talked about very much in business schools. So for those of you who, who are kind of missing it, you're probably not wrong about that. Now, at the same time, it's, oh, sorry, it's uh, changing very rapidly. Uh, and I'm hoping that people will really actually start to talk about strain, strong sustainability, sustainability for the planet more. Um, one, of the, one of the problems as I see it is that most sustainability courses have been electives in, the, in these business schools, at least that Nancy Landrum studied. And I really think, uh, as, um, as you said, that it should be across the curriculum. So um, I just put in this a couple of slides here about what, if you were thinking about supply chain management in each of the five practices, what is it that you would want to know? I'm not gonna read all of this uh, to you, but, um, just hit a couple of the highlights. So practice one is get the truth. And I think that being able to read basic science and work with basic science um, and understanding where you're getting your information are key, not only for supply chain managers, but for everyone. Now moving down to assessing the risks, um, uh, McKinsey recently did a, a public, a publication about supply chain risk in, in particular, and you can take a look at that, uh, find it easily on the internet. Um, you know, every, everything, is, everything is up in the air. There's a lot of risk out there right now. Um, and because we've had disruptions to the pr uh, production and supply chains uh, globally, some people say it's been extreme. It's certainly unusual. Uh, some other people say it's, you know, manageable. Uh, I'm not, knowledgeable enough to be able to say something about that. Uh, but there's also opportunities in supply chain as well, such as an ice-free Arctic and, and moving our ships through there. Um, in terms of weighing the stakes, one of the key things is, you know, what is gonna be the role of renewables? One of the battles here is between black energy and green energy, and where's that gonna go? I don't know the answer to that, but things are improving on the green side. Uh, in terms of, defining the business of business, we already talked a bit about uh, re recruitment and retention uh, regulation. Um, and you guys know better than I do, which companies can afford to take the lead in investing in supply chain innovation, which is obviously could be a game changer. Um, as you know, container shipping was a game changer. What the next game changer is probably, and again, you know it better than I do, it's probably in information technology and uh, uh, that area. Um, so also looking ahead, and we're going to go to this in a minute, looking ahead to engaging global leadership, let's just say that uh, various countries across the world decide to put a price on carbon. How will that affect 
supply chains could be an amazing, amazing influence. And it's one of the things that uh, all of you in your in your companies, maybe you not 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 your particular role, but somebody needs to be looking at that and and anticipating that. Years ago, when I worked at IBM, they had a, a particular group of of people that each each took on a country, and their job was to know what are the trends in that country. Um, uh, environmental scanning is very very important uh, for for business in general and supply chain in particular. Um, for me, when I teach this, I often ask my students to, to do a white paper, which is to divide, advise a client on a decision, which in your case would be at the intersection of supply chain, climate, and policy. So I require my students to choose a particular client, could be a particular company, a particular um, uh, division in a, in a, in a government, it could be a building, uh, maybe a high rise apartment building or something and advise them on a decision at the intersection of, of these factors using the, using the science to the extent that they can read the science and, and figure that out and make very specific recommendations. And you have some examples there. So my view, is, as I've said, is that this should be done, that we should have this education across the university. And if you're interested in this, and I think if, if you're in student government, um, it wouldn't hurt you to, to look at this climate change manifesto, which you can find uh, on my website in my, in my blog, uh, which suggests these are the sorts of things that all students need to know. Um, you know, how energy sources influence human history, the influence of fossil fuels, the emerging contribution of green energy, the basics of climate change science, the importance of finding and contextualizing science politically, um, how social science can guide decision making, and I'm going to get to that in a second, and so on. I won't go through the whole thing, but you know, your university has a responsibility to you and you have a responsibility to them, both of you finding a path towards really looking at um, strong sustainability. Okay, so the, the last practice is to engage global leadership. And it's, um, you know, who is going to get this done? What are we going to do? So are we going to do fossil fuel rationing? Are we going to follow econo ec ecological economics, the evolution of capitalism? In my classes, my students discuss these things in depth, much more than I have time to, to tell you today. Um, bottom line is success for teen humanity is going to require a plan. And Paris, again, a plan requires an implementation strategy and leadership. It can't be just, here's the problem. What are you gonna do about it, right? One of my pet peeves is there's so many films out there, beautiful films on of the science of, of climate change. And then they spend the last 10 minutes talking about change and it's very vague usually. It's usually about we should cooperate more. No, we need to do much more than that engaging young people in what change means. So Paris um, is, gets people talking, but it is not a plan. It doesn't have these elements. Kyoto had a plan. It actually fined people if they didn't follow uh, the, the guidelines for CO2 emissions. But as soon as company, uh, countries came up to the, um, to the time where they might uh, be emitting uh, and get fined, they all pulled out. So you know that plan failed, basically. Um, I also want to encourage you to, to improve and continue to develop your thinking about doing, changing the system, not just the light bulb. This is, in fact, my motto. Um, there are some plans out there. I'm going to skip over these just in the interest of time. I'd like to try to finish my talk by 6.10 so you guys can ask, ask questions. The En-ROAD simulation that you can play with online, I highly recommend. It is a plan. It's a it's a, uh, a simulation, it's free online. You can go there right now while we're, while we're talking here and, and play around with the, uh, the solutions to try to get it to add up to keeping climate change to a, um, uh, a, a reasonable level. This, this simulation is created at MIT. It's very scientifically based and based on models with feedbacks uh, that are fairly sophisticated. So, and it adds up. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't add up to a solution. It's almost impossible to find a solution. And so if you take the En-ROADS training, which you can take, it's about an hour, they will mention that. They will talk about, well, yeah, everybody uses this, 
but uh, it also is chastening uh, and really, uh, you know, it's not necessarily showing you a solution, but showing you some of the paths to solutions. Okay, so the last little pitch I want to make is for social science in the five practices. Um, and in each, what I did as I, as I spent 10 years working with my students as a social scientist, I was always very interested in what the, the, the most important and most influential and most data-based scientists were saying about how uh, humanity is going to solve this problem. So I always integrate this in, into my teaching. So social science can help us to estimate the probability, for example, that a government will put a price on carbon or that Texas will invest significantly in its energy system or that the United States and Canada will coordinate their green energy policies. This is the sort of thing that it can help us to estimate. Um, my thesis based on what I've, what I've read and it's all presented to you in the book is that cooperative approaches like the Paris Accords are not likely to be strong enough and they're not likely to be fast enough. And I base it on the following kinds of um, data. So excuse me, I'm gonna read some of this for emphasis. So Daniel Kahneman is uh, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist and he, he works at the very micro level, like how are, we, how are we wired? And when people asked him, about whether he thinks that human beings are, are gonna be able to solve the, solve the climate problem. You can read the, the beginning. Um, there's not good news. I am deeply pessimistic. I really see no path to success on climate change. Uh, Daniel Gilbert, one of his colleagues in, at Harvard said of this problem, a psychologist could barely dream up a better scenario for paralysis. Um, some folks that research uh, how well companies and sectors cooperate, writes that whereas humans may have evolved an intuition to cooperate, it is unlikely such intuition will bring world peace. In their case, that was their subject, will bring world peace closer. Uh, we are basically, the technical term is parochial altruistic, the word that we're more familiar with is tribal. We are tribal, according to the researchers. That's not a myth, it's a fact. Um, we're not very trusting. This expert says we are not likely to be able to get the nations of the world to work together on climate change or the reduction of inequality. Neither the needed attitudes nor the skills are widely enough distributed. Um, Stan Cox says we're not particularly self-sacrificing. We have to reckon with the fact that from 1947 to 2008, we had a collision, which is when he was writing, we had a collision with affluence and it changed us as a people. It changed our political expectations. It changed us morally and we lost a sense of discipline. Try to impose a carbon tax, let alone rationing today and you'll hear moaning and groaning from all over. Um, and many pe people have tried imposing a carbon tax and, and including in the United States, including in my state and have failed. Um, these folks have looked at global organizations like, uh, like the Paris Accords, and they say that there will be a rocky road ahead and the stakes, the stakes are whose way of life gets to survive, but uh, cooperation problems continue to stymie effective global climate governance. In other words, we're not looking for world governance. We don't want it. We, we'd rather try to hash it out, but then we fail to hash it out. What can we learn from history? Very interesting book by Jared Diamond on collapse argues that, um, Societies are not likely to recognize the climate change problem in time and have been powerless to stop it uh, for a whole many reasons. And that most societies have failed because of resource allocation problems. So if we believe that team humanity is weak in on cooperation, uh, the challenge for leaders is to persuade people that they have to sacrifice in the present to support a decent life in the future, to help people to let go of their tribalism and move to a different uh, plane and to develop plans that actually add up so that if a person does devote their time and resources to, to doing X, that they can see actually what it actually contributes to change. And that's possible, but we're not doing a very good job of it. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is cooperation is not the only characteristic of, of human beings that gets things done. We also are creative, intelligent, adventurous, assertive, and competitive. And our entrepreneurs are, are people who are innovative risk takers uh, who, who love to solve problems. They do it competitively, not cooperatively, but nevertheless, they're solving problems. So um, 
uh, just with two minutes, let me just see what I've got left here. Um, there's a, a company out there that's sponsored by Bill Gates that is exemplifies the kind of uh, the kind of problem solving that we probably need. If the cement industry, so this is a problem in cement. If the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. And some new technology by the, co the company Heliogen uh, suggests that we could reduce cement CO2 by 40% if their, if their uh, technology is adopted. Now they're at the a stage where they need uh, all kinds of support to roll this out. But isn't that fascinating? We could reduce cement CO2 by 40%. So a, a major sector in the world economy, we could, we could take that sector and reduce the CO2 by 40%. Who would blame you as young people? Um, who would blame you if you got really excited about this kind of systemic innovation and, and pushing that in your own field of supply chain? So um, in my view, we need to promote innovation. And I'm not an expert in innovation. My work kind of stops here. My work stops at the social science. Um, but I think it, to promote in, in, innovation, we do need to build a constituency for R&D. The you know, general public needs to really understand that this can be supported by government uh, and that uh, we, we can, um, can work with the competitive side. There's a couple of sources on this for those of you who might be interested in, in investigating this further. There's something called the MIT Energy Initiative, which you can join and uh, join in their seminars to be absolutely up to date on the kinds of uh, energy innovations that are out there that are being worked on by the, the young PhDs uh, at MIT. And then Bill Gates most recently has published a book called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster that focuses totally on innovation and how uh, my, my, I believe that Bill Gates is, is quite possibly um, uh, throwing that Hail Mary pass at us saying, you know, this is how, this is how we're gonna get it done. So, so support innovation further. Um, so I hope you'll all be thinking about process innovations in, in supply chain uh, and in other areas of business in which you're interested. So that's my pitch, I am done. I do want to uh, encourage you to, to take a look at my uh, uh, website, uh, rayandre.com. It's got a blog, which comes and goes. Uh, it's got lots of resources. And feel free to contact me anytime if you've got questions uh, for, on, on any of this, because you know, this is my mission right now. Uh, and I'm um, dedicated to helping you if you need help. So thank you.